Welcome back Rangers, this is part three of the First Aid Skills Merit. Uh, we're continuing on with wound management. We just finished how to uh, take care of a cut. Now we're going to move on to blisters. So some of you might have actually had a blister if you've been on a hiking or camping trip and you know that they are not fun. Blisters are very painful and can put a stop to any trip. Now what they're actually caused by is clothing, equipment, or other skin rubbing against skin. And the first sign of a blister is a hot spot. Not many people know that a hot spot is already considered an injury and if it gets worse it will develop into a blister and pain will increase as well. So there's two criteria for treating a blister. One is popping and one is not popping. And we're going to go over why you would pop one and why you wouldn't pop it. So if you have a, a blister, let's say you didn't take care of the hot spot, developed into a blister, let's say it's on your heel, and it's larger than two centimeters or it's at risk of popping on its own, like we said, if it's on your heel and you're going to continue hiking, then, then it could pop on its own in there. And if it pops in that environment where there's a lot of bacteria and a lot of dirt, then it can turn into an infection and that will be really bad. So we don't want that to happen. So if there is a risk of it popping on its own, then we're going to want to pop it first and then keep it clean. So the way we do that, first we you know, would take our boot off, remove our sock, and find the blister and we'd clean it with warm soapy water. We want to make sure the area is all clean. Second, what we do is we're going to take a needle and this is what we're actually going to be popping the blister with. Now, you don't know where this needle has been. If it's been sitting in your backpack all day long, it's probably dirty and you're going to want to clean it off. Now to clean it, what you can simply do is take a lighter and just heat the tip and that burns off any germs. Now the way we're going to want to pop it once we've cleaned the area and once we've sterilized our needle is let's say that this uh, white circle is our blister, right? It's directly on our heel. We're going to want to pop it at the base of the blister. So you put a small little hole in it with the needle and then you can drain all the pus out of the blister. Now after you drain the pus out of the blister, it's open so you're going to want to close it. Now the way we do that is with a tegaderm dressing or a uh, clear sterile dressing that you can see through and these actually will uh, stay on your skin for about four to seven days regardless of if it's a wet environment or not and it'll keep everything clean and protected. Now once you put this on, there's something called moleskin that's really great for blisters as well. So moleskin is a sheet of fabric that is soft on one side and sticky on the other. So let's say we have our dressing on our blister that we've just popped. So now it's just that flap of skin. We want to cover the tegaderm dressing with the moleskin. Now what this does is it prevents any more friction from rubbing onto that uh, already uh, injured site and doesn't create another blister or make that pop site worse. Now, if we don't meet that criteria to pop it, and it's small, and we want to leave it alone, then what we're going to do is we're going to also use moleskin, but we're going to cut a little hole into a little circle of moleskin. Now, what this does is this allows the blister to poke through the hole and breathe, but the moleskin around it keeps everything else, such as the sock or other garments, off of the blister. And it removes anything from rubbing over it. Now you can create multiple um, donut holes of these and put them on top of each other until you raise it enough off the skin to where no more friction will be rubbing on that site. So that's how you take care of a blister. Next we're going to move on to puncture wounds. Now, puncture wounds are an interesting subject because there's two different ways we look at puncture wounds. They can be large or they can be small. Now, a small puncture wound is something like uh, a stinger or a splinter or a staple. Now, those you can remove and, you know, make sure you're clean um, so that you don't create any infection. But anything larger than that, you don't want to remove, such as a nail, a knife, a pencil, uh, or a stick that should be left. Now the reason you don't want to remove a large puncture wound, we're going to demonstrate here, is because 
if you puncture your skin, let's say this is your skin, and you have an object stuck inside your skin, let's say this pen is a stick or a pencil, um, and it gets stuck in your skin, simply like this. It could be holding back the pressure of blood. See how some water is dripping, but it's not flowing out? This is the same thing that's happening inside of your body. So whatever is punctured inside of your skin could be stopping the bleeding. Now let's say we go ahead and remove it. All of that blood, all of that water is just going to come right out. And that is something we do not want because that can lead to hypovolemic shock or loss of blood volume, which is what we discussed before. So anything larger than um, you know, a staple or a splinter, such as uh, a nail, knife, pencil, or stick, we want to leave in. Now, even though we're going to leave it in, we're not done there. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to clean the site to make sure that there's no germs that could get in because if you have a puncture in your skin, the deeper it is, the worse an infection could be. So we're going to want to clean the site around that area. So once we clean it, we can put some dry sterile dressings and some tape around it or tape it in place, keep it from moving. Um, that way it doesn't make the injury worse. Now for small puncture wounds, you can simply take, let's say if it's a splinter, we're going to want to clean the site as well, just like with the, the large wound, with soap and water. And we're going to take something like tweezers. We want to make sure that our tweezers are sterile, just like our needle. We can use a lighter to heat it up and kill any germs. We can take out, let's say we have a, a splinter right on my finger, just grab it with the tweezers and take it right out. So that's a small puncture uh, wound where you would take it out, but a large puncture wound, you wouldn't. Just like we saw with the bag, we want to make sure that um, the person does not bleed out. Now moving on, our last uh, wound that we're going to go over for bleeding is arterial bleeding of any extremity. Um, now arterial bleeding is defined as higher pressure bleeding than veins or capillaries. Now like we discussed before in our primary assessment, March, the first letter is M for massive hemorrhage, we ask ourselves is there a massive hemorrhage? And this is treated with direct pressure and a tourniquet. Um, and we're treating the arterial bleeding, the high pressure bleeding. Now, this can be caused from chopping wood, let's say you're chopping and you hit your leg and you nick an artery or you're using a chainsaw and it kicks back and nicks your arm and you hit an artery. Your bleeding is going to be very high pressured because your arteries are under high pressure. Now once you see this arterial bleeding, you're on the clock and you only have seconds to stop it. Now in your book you'll notice there's something called the bleeding flow chart, which is this. That is not for arterial bleeding. This bleeding flow chart is only for venous and capillary bleeding. Because our arterial bleeding, as soon as we find our patient, is going to be managed under our first item. That is the first, correct, uh, first, thing, first injury that we're going to manage on our patients. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can use direct pressure for something that's flowing or oozing, let's say if it's in the, the center of your body. Then you're going to use uh, gauze or something called a blood stopper or an Israeli bandage where you can package that up and then create pressure on it to stop it from bleeding. Now the other item we can use is called a tourniquet. Now this is a tourniquet. Tourniquets are used on extremities. Uh, only four extremities are legs, uh, right leg, left leg, right arm, left arm. The head is, we do not put it around the head or anything else, just our legs and our arms. So to do that, we're going to demonstrate on Commander Gary. Let's say he has a spurting uh, arterial bleed from his forearm over here. What we're going to want to do is apply our tourniquet. So with that, we put it on high and tight. You're going to want to remember those words. The reason we tell you guys to do it high and tight is because 
you're not trained as medical professionals to be able to find exactly where the bleed is. So you want to put it as high up as possible to stop that bleeding from happening. So you tighten down this tourniquet once it's applied, and then you would twist this windlass here. Now you can see he's already kind of grimacing in pain, but tourniquets are very, very painful, and you want to let your uh, patient know that once you tighten it down, it will be very painful. Um, and this can take a while. So where you would tighten it until the bleeding stops, and then there's a little hook over here that you can slide the windlass into, and that stays in place and is tightened and stops the bleeding. Now after you stop the bleeding, there's a little spot on most tourniquets. It can be over here or on the top of the tourniquet where you write the time. The reason you want to know the time is so that surgeons, once they go in here and fix this, will know how long the tourniquet has been on. That's very important. So now we'll take you out of here. Thank you. Now the tourniquet that I have here today is called a soft T wide. It's a special operations forces tourniquet. Um, and you want to make sure that you have one that is wide and not thin. The thinner it is, the more harm it can cause to that extremity, and it'll also take more wraps to stop the bleeding. The wider it is, the more pressure you can apply, and the easier it'll be to stop the bleeding. They also make other tourniquets called um, the CAT tourniquet, which is a combat, combat application tourniquet. This is another good recommended tourniquet. You can find the list online, but you want to make sure that you get one that has a windlass. No ratcheting ones or, or things that do not have a windlass because they are not uh, approved by uh, different trauma committees. So you want to make sure you have an approved tourniquet by the trauma committee. And with that, that concludes part three of our first aid skills merit. So this is going to wind up turning into a four-part series. So stay tuned for uh, part four where we go over uh, the rest of the merit. Silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, -oh. you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my to show up.